Welcome to the What If It's Not Depression podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Achina Stein, and I am going to talk today with Dr. Scott Antoine about pans and pandas, and they are not animals. <laughs> we'll learn more about what that is. The reason I brought him onto uh, the show is because there are a lot of people who are uh, diagnosed depression, anxiety, even psychosis, and ultimately end up having this syndrome called pandas or pans, which you will learn about soon enough. But let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Antoine. He completed his undergraduate training at the University of Scranton in Pennsylvania. And uh, there, after that, he completed his doctorate at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he is a fellow DO, just like me, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually graduated from New Jersey School of Osteopathic Medicine right across the river from him. He did his emergency medicine residency and an emergency medical services fellowship at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, served seven years of active duty with the United States Army as an emergency medicine physician. He moved to Indianapolis in 2005 after his term of service and worked as an emergency physician at St. Francis Hospital in 2019. So in addition to his board certification in emergency medicine, he achieved board certification in integrative medicine through the newly formed American Board of Integrative Medicine in 2016 and holds certifications in functional medicine through the Institute for Functional Medicine and the A4M. So we're going to learn more about him and his journey through his daughter's story and to learn more about pans and pandas. If you like this episode, please click the like button and subscribe. So welcome, Dr. Antoine. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. So you have an incredible story. And just like me with my son, you are having my story and why I do functional medicine. And you have an equally uh, incredible story with your daughter. Why don't you start with that and let us know what she went through and what you finally diagnosed or, you know, as her having uh, one of these conditions that we've talked about that I just mentioned. Tell us more. Sure. Sure. So I have a daughter. Her name is Emma and she's 20 now. She was about 12 and um, she came to me one day and she said, I, I don't think God likes me. I don't think I'm a good person. Um, she talked about hearing voices telling her to do good things and bad things. And she felt like she wanted to choose the bad. Um, she also started washing her hands compulsively till they were bleeding. She lost really the ability to sleep. Night was sort of a screaming match uh, in our house. And wow. she was a great student. Suddenly her grades completely tanked. She started wetting the bed uh, just at the age of 12. Um, and just, it was just crazy. So my wife, Ellen is also a physician and we've been physicians, I guess 15 or well, about, no, about 20 years at this point. And so we talked about it. We called the pediatrician. We didn't really get a call back. We explained what was going on. And so we, did what you do as a physician, we hit the books. And about three nights later, about 10 o'clock at night, uh, Ellen came to me and she said, I know what Emma has, she has pandas. And I said, I don't, I don't know what that is. And she handed me an article and I read the article and sure enough, she had every single criteria. So pandas is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with strep infection. So it's a disorder where children get a strep infection. And then rather than just attacking the bacteria, their immune system starts attacking part of their brain and gives them all the symptoms Emma had and, and more actually. Mm. Um, and so I said, oh, okay, now we know what's going on. So the next day I called to our children's hospital where we live and, and talked to someone in infectious disease. They're one of the docs. And he said, pandas doesn't exist and hung up the phone. Wow. And I said, well, wow. I'm reading <laughs> stuff from the National Institute of Mental Health, <laughs> you know, um, from these researchers and they're treating these children. These children are getting better. And so we ultimately found a physician in New York state. And so Emma and Ellen flew out to New York state to see him. And he took one look at her and said, of course, this is pandas. And she really needs intravenous immune globulin, IVIG. And that's a, an infusion it goes through an IV of a, a blood product, which sort of resets the immune system. We don't know exactly how it works, but so they came back and I thought, great, now we have an answer. We know what we need to do. And her behavior kind of continued to deteriorate. 
and I called a pediatric neurologist here that I knew used IVIG for other things in kids and said, this is what's going on. I explained all the symptoms of my daughter, told him what was going on, and he said, it sounds like she just needs to be locked in a psych ward and put on antipsychotic medication. Oh my gosh. And I, I just, I, I said like, look, I, I'm a doctor. Medicines all have their place. They really do. But I looked at this and said like, she was fine three weeks ago and now she's like, this has got to be something else. Um, and so just not, not our daughter. We're not just not going to do that. So we hit the books again. Ultimately found a physician in a neighboring state. We got Emma IVIG and four days later, her symptoms were gone. Wow. Wow. And so at that point, uh, you know, we studied more about the condition. We had already been seeing patients in our, in our functional and integrative medicine office. And I just felt like at that minute, my specialty found me. I just felt like I can't let this happen because that happened to my wife and I were both physicians. Right. Like, I know. You, and so this is a story I hear over and over and over again with these kids. Um, there's also, and in my daughter's case, in addition to high strep antibodies, she also had Lyme disease. And so occasionally, well, not occasionally, it's pretty common, children can get other infections that can trigger uh, this syndrome. In that case, it's, it's not called PANDAS because it's not strep, it's called PANS, Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. And that's the term I tend to use more often because that includes strep, but it includes a lot of other things, including environmental toxins and, and things like that. And I just felt really like, I need to do something. I need to take care of these kids. I think I can figure a better way to do this. Um, right. So that's how I ended up where I am. Yeah, yeah. And so much so that you actually changed legislation in the state of Indiana. Tell us more about that. So, you know, pandas, and there's a lot of reasons for it. I, I think one of the main reasons that pandas and pans are controversial is because it forces people to do a lot of what your work does, which is it forces people to look at mental health in an entirely different way, right? That doesn't quite compute that mental health is not an, it, 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 mental illness is not an accident. You don't fall down, walk down the street and get hit by the bipolar bus. It just doesn't, it, so there's a lot of these cases where there is a physiological syndrome that you can deal with, but nevertheless, it's remained controversial. So many um, insurance companies, will deny intravenous immunoglobulin IVIG for pandas. They'll say that's experimental. There's no proof it works, despite probably five or six good articles from peer reviewed literature that says it does. But anyway, they will deny coverage. And so in 2019, um, we were able to uh, go to the state legislator here in, in Indiana and pass a law. It was passed in 2020. Unfortunately, we couldn't go to the signing because it was like in April of 2020. No mm. one could go in the courthouse because of the pandemic. But wow. uh, anyway, we got a law passed that says that insurers in Indiana cannot deny coverage based on solely on the diagnosis of pans and pandas being written in the chart. Um, and so it's uh, so these children now have access to IVIG. And so it's right. still a bit of a battle. I still have to remind insurers of that as I'm doing peer to peers and writing letters of support for, for IVIG for these critically ill kids. Wow, wow. And what about other states? Do you see that there happening are, in other states as well? I think that there are about seven other states right now that have similar legislation. I'm actually going to be speaking to the folks in, in California uh, in a few weeks. They're marshalling their, their forces to try and get this together. but. Um, and what's interesting to me, I never would have thought would have happened, you know, in Indiana here was, you know, we had probably 10 moms with me that talked, each took turns talking to the senators about their children and how sick they were. And the insurance company actually set rep sent representatives to shut the thing down. They were unsuccessful, fortunately, but tried to block the legislation and, and so that wow. they didn't have to pay, but yeah, it's wow. still, still a battle. Wow. That's, that's an incredible story. And I'm, I'm really, really, uh, applaud your efforts. Cause I know it takes a great deal of energy to, you know, to support legislation. You have to go sit there for hours and wait your turn to say, mm -hmm. you know, what you need to say. And, and you have to go back again and again and again. Right. It's just, I, I've done the sa same kind of thing for certain uh, changes in my state as well. So, so 
I would love for you to, uh, before I even get there, because I, you know, I know people are like, what is this? <laughs> you know, but I, I, I want to drill home that, you know, what you're saying is that, yes, this is true for pants and pandas, but I think all mental illnesses, I believe strongly that all mental illnesses have root causes in medical issues, at least some amount of it, whether it's nutritional deficiencies uh, or, um, or uh, toxicities or gut dysbiosis or stress, that combination mm -hmm. of those things and hormonal changes all can come to this perfect storm where it expresses itself as a mental illness. And, and even if it starts out as some kind of emotional disturbance, ultimately the body kind of breaks down and being able to handle those emotional disturbances. Mm -hmm. So there is this line, I just want to tell everybody <laughs> that there's this line in the DSM-5 for every single disorder that says it has to, all medical disorders have to be ruled out or it cannot be you know, attributed to a medical disorder before you give the, the psychiatric diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right that people don't really take the time to figure it out. It's not just doing a CBC, a uh, comprehensive metabolic ban on a, and a TSH and a urine right. drug screen, which is what's typically done in a screening for medical disorders, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in that it's, it's, it's almost a farce when we as psychiatrists are not actually practicing medicine and treating the whole body, really should be looking at every single issue possible to rule out. And there's a methodology, methodology around it that we're not really actually practicing, in my opinion. So, you know, that I just wanted to sit, get on my soapbox and say that a little bit. I think psychiatrists really need to take more responsibility about the medical piece and really drilling down in those areas and not just treating the head without looking at the whole body. So tell, tell us about what actually is PANDAS. Can, can you just stop sure. and start psychiatric symptoms because a lot of times right. these these il these illnesses or syndromes start with psychiatric symptoms and then it evolves into this this bigger picture and unfortunately people don't get treated or seen from the medical community until like mm -hmm. I don't know how many years. Why don't you tell us how many years it tells? It's, <laughs> yeah, the delay in diagnosis for most kids with pandas and pans is about two years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I absolutely love everything that you said. Here's what's fascinating about pans and pandas is they are clearly medical disorders. And I'll talk a little bit about what actually kind of causes them on the on the, the cell level in a minute. But they are medical disorders, but they don't require any blood tests any radiology test to diagnose them. You would actually be interested to know as a psychiatrist that the diagnostic criteria for pans and pandas look like you're reading from the DSM. Basically, it's lists of behaviors and findings on neuropsychiatric testing. And then at the very bottom, there's a little asterisk. And when I give lectures on this to physicians, I always say this little asterisk on the bottom of the criteria says not better explained by another medical or neurologic illness, meaning I don't want to take a child and just assume it's pans and pandas because that's what I see all day in my office because the, sometimes they need an MRI. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's a brain tumor or they need a spinal tap because it's meningitis or something else. So there are that that level. But so what 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 happens in pans and pandas is the immune system, for some reason, responds to either a toxin or an infection. And rather than just attacking that, attacks a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And it attacks the same way. And they've shown back in the 90s, they actually showed when the first they started talking about this, they proved that there are specific neuron, measurable neuronal antibodies that attack the brain that you can measure in the bloodstream mm. in children that have this. It's the same type of antibodies we see in rheumatic fever, which comes from strep infections we've known about for years. And there's one particular finding you see in rheumatic fever, it can cause ticks, something called Sydenham chorea. And in those children, they have antineural antibodies. Well, wouldn't you know the same antineural antibodies we find in children with pans and pandas. So it's an instance of 
what's called molecular mimicry, the bacteria, the strep bacteria or other bacteria, mycoplasma, Lyme disease, those bacteria have proteins that look like parts of our brain. So when your body's attacking those things, it mistakes your brain, mistake of mistaken identity, and attacks parts of your brain, causes inflammation, and then causes these symptoms. So to diagnose pans or pandas, basically, the classic definition, uh, and I'll tell you why I said that in a minute, but the classic definition is either sudden onset severe, all three of those words are important, sudden onset severe OCD and or restrictive eating, and what restrictive eating looks like is typically these kids will say, I feel like I'm gonna choke. I can't swallow. Um, I, I don't like the texture of that food. Sometimes it's something they've eaten for their entire, whole life, but they will develop sudden food restrictions. But one, one or both of those plus four of the following seven groups of criteria. So one group is anxiety, specifically separation anxiety. These kids suddenly are glued to their parent they're 10 years old and people are having to peel them off their parent to get them into the school building. Just very odd. Um, labile mood or depression. Um, these kids are very labile, meaning they will be sitting, watching a movie with their parents, eating popcorn, and they will suddenly throw the popcorn, get up and push everything off the table. Like it's, it, it's unpredictable. Mm. It's illogical. Wow. Um, they commonly will have suicidal ideation. They will, they will talk about suicide. Um, they a lot of them try and open the car door when the car is driving like when i hear that as soon as a parent says that i'm like oh this is pans it's such a typical thing and wow. it's not always that fortunately none of them have completed the act i haven't had any children traumatically injured from that but it's a common thing or they'll say i'm going to jump out the window in the house and start opening the window so um so labile mood depression they also have change in school performance um handwriting changes are very very common um, handwriting will go from sort of neat kid writing to just unbelievably toddler writing, inability to draw, um, inability to comprehend. A lot of these children end up getting initially diagnosed as having ADHD because suddenly they start failing school, can't pay attention, they seem distracted, they're having repetitive thoughts. So you'll see school deterioration. Also, um, one of the other categories is um, regression of behavior. So children will suddenly start baby talking or playing with age inappropriate toys, finger painting the age of 10 or 11. They will just, just um, do very emotionally immature. Very, and you'll very also severe see, um, yeah. Yeah, you'll see physical signs uh, such as tics. So commonly facial tics. And I always tell this story, it's terrible, but when my daughter first got sick, one of the things she was doing was she had sort of an eye rolling tick and she'd go like this and she'd be very frustrated when she did it. And I used to say to her, you're a teenager now, you need to learn how to roll your eyes. Like you're not doing it right. It turned out it was a facial tic. So I've apologized since then. And you'll see a lot of mouth tics, facial tics, um, throat clearing, <clears throat> where they're doing it like a hundred times an hour, um, which ultimately a lot of times gets diagnosed as allergies or post-nasal drip or whatever. Um, and then you'll see uh, problems with coordination. So these kids will suddenly forget how to ride their bike or fall or be clumsy, drop things. And um, lastly, you'll see somatic signs or symptoms. And the big one there is urinary changes. So children will suddenly have to urinate every 15 minutes. You'll get them tested. There's no urinary tract infection. Uh, they also, when they have to go, it's an emergency. They'll, they'll just be playing and all of a sudden it's an emergency. They're running to the bathroom. They will pee the bed sometimes, have, have um, nighttime urination in their bed. So that list sort of, and when you see children with this, it's not usually like you're trying to fit them in. There's, it's, they usually have almost every single sign and symptom. Hmm. I call those the classical criteria because not every child fits exactly. And so you'll see about 40% of the time, you'll see it's not as sudden onset as you would think it is. So when my daughter came to us, like a sudden worsening. But when we looked back, we noticed that she was having, um, you know, we pray before we ate every day and she was taking longer and longer to finish. So we'd all be done praying and she'd be sitting there with her eyes closed and her lips moving for like five minutes. Then it was 10 minutes, then it was 15 minutes. So she developed, a lot of these kids will develop, if they go to a family of faith, they'll develop sort of a religious obsession. Um, they'll talk about going to hell or being evil. Um, one recent one that's come a lot, up a lot is kids saying, um, I'm afraid I'm a racist. 
Mm. And they're not, but they have an incredible fear they're a racist. Or they'll say, I'm afraid I'm gay mm. because they, I'm afraid I'm people will judge me and then will be whatever. And so those types of uh, a fear of a fear almost. Right. So we see, so that's sort of the classical presentation. Not every child fits. But what I like to tell parents is when they come and see me, like I don't do you a diagnosis a favor if I give you a diagnosis. <laughs> so like I, if you don't, if your child doesn't fit exactly into the diagnosis, if all they have is sudden onset OCD, I can help that. That's we got to look at all the medical stuff first anyway, because just because your child didn't meet every other criteria, maybe we're early. Maybe, you know, we were catching something early. Right. Or if your child suddenly, you know, start lost intellectual ability, that's a whole other work up in and of itself, which would push me more toward an MRI or whatever. So that's the sort of the criteria we go down. But I tell parents, you don't, I don't worry specifically about, about criteria. You know, Jeff Bland talks, about Dr. Jeff Bland wrote a book called The Disease Delusion, the idea that diseases are just lists. You right. know, if you have a heart attack, then you might say you had chest pain, shortness of breath, and I can look at your EKG and say, oh, that's a heart attack. And your blood level of troponin went up, so you had a heart attack. I'm, it's just a list of stuff. So, right. right, right. Yeah, and it, more and more we're finding that people present differently uh, mm -hmm. with with lots of illnesses. I mean, how many people, uh, women specifically have heart attacks and they're silent or they have back pain mm -hmm. instead of, you know, chest pain. And so it's really looking at, looking at the art of medicine, right? And not just the science of medicine and, and looking at what you're, so it is getting their, their story and their history and how things evolve over time. That's really important. But you're right that having, obviously you do need to have the right diagnosis and know that it isn't something more serious. Mm -hmm. And so I like the idea of you having that, that asterisk, <laughs> you know, you have, you have to rule out, and that's just part of the differential, what we call a differential diagnosis. You wanna sure. rule out these more acute, serious things. Uh, not that this isn't serious, because obviously people are suffering for quite yeah. some time, but you, you want to know what you're dealing with so you don't know how to treat it. So, you know, I, I don't remember, I, you were going through the list and did you say anything about joint pain? Uh, I did not, but that's a good point. So yeah. um, a lot of these kids have pain. Uh, typically they have migratory pain. Um, They'll, they'll have joint pain, migratory pain. Some of them are diagnosed occasionally with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, although it's usually what's called seronegative, meaning there's no blood changes with, with it at all. About 48% of them have a positive anti-nuclear antibody in studies, which is a, a blood marker we sometimes see elevated in people with lupus and other autoimmune diseases, as you know. So um, there's definitely a lot of times uh, migratory pain, joint pain, and a lot of that can end up being from the primary cause. So we mentioned strep, but there are other bacterial causes, and a significant proportion of these kids also have tick-borne illness, either Lyme disease or Bartonella or one of the other tick-borne illnesses, and uh, that those certainly can cause pain. And also, a lot of the joint pain, in my experience, comes from uh, these kids tend to have um, issues with increased intestinal permeability, what people call leaky gut. And so they all, a lot of them have tend to have quite a few food allergies and sensitivities. And so a lot of times when we test for those, it's really tough with these kids behaviorally. And also I, I never change anyone's diet who has food restriction. That's bad news because that's some of those kids anyway end up in the hospital with feeding tube and high dose, um, you know, IVIG or other treatments because that can right. be an absolute emergency. So those kids, I just tell the parents whatever they'll eat, like Captain Crunch is fine with me. Like just right. like, we'll try and make healthy -er choices, but if we don't like absolutely eliminate gluten and dairy, well, it'll be fine. We'll work right, it out right. later. Yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah, I have uh, the same philosophy. I mean, it's better to just add as many vegetables as you can, <laughs> you, know? Right. you know, let's right. add things, not take away things uh, right now, right. you know, and then you, we can cross that bridge when we need to, <laughs> when you, we really need to, right? Exactly. Yeah, right. when address all the other possible root causes. So is the IBIG just for strep? Is, is that the only, is that the treatment just for that particular bacterial uh, no, the, um, so um, I kind of tell parents there's there's four things to fix when we have kids with pans and pandas. There's there's four things to fix. One is infections, so we got to deal with the infection some way, whatever it is. We got to find it and deal with it. Toxins, and so toxins 
um, can be industrial toxins, mycotoxins from mold exposures is a huge cause of immune dysregulation. But also stress, you mentioned stress in my mind is the number one toxin known to man. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, so, so infections, toxins, the third sort of loop in that belt is immune dysregulation. So, you know, if you, th if you think about it, we kind of look, think about this and, and we, a lot of people will say, well, pans and pandas are autoimmune disorders because your body's attacking itself. True. But if we think about it, like most autoimmune disorders, we think, oh, the immune system dial is just turned way up and it's just stuck. Well, that, well that's true. But in these kids, when we measure, a lot of times they have low levels of immune globulins. They tend to get sick more often than other kids. They don't make antibody responses when they get medications or vaccines. So they have an immune deficiency. So really it's a situation where the immune dial is, it's dysregulated. It's not doing ever what it's supposed to do. So correcting that immune dysregulation is super important. That's where IVIG comes in. Right. So we don't know exactly how IVIG works. We think that what it does is it goes into the system, mops up all of the autoantibodies, and then seems to somehow like reset. It's like pushing the reset button on the computer. Like it just somehow resets the system. And it doesn't work for every child. And it's not required for every child. But resetting that, that immune system or, or re-regulating it. What I tell parents is unfortunately lots of, I'm, I'm a great fan of support but there are a lot of support groups on social media that kind of people will say, well, like, you know, Timmy's been sick for 12 years and they told me he'll have pans or pandas the rest of his life. And when we see children that flare and flare and flare and flare and flare, it's immune dysregulation. If you get the immune dysregulation piece right, they end up a lot of times like every other child because a lot of kids get strep. Why don't they all get pandas, right? There's an right. immune system issue. And then the last thing, so infections, toxins, immune dysregulation, the last thing are neural loops, I call them. Mm -hmm. So the OCD behavior, sometimes we fix the other three things and the child's still doing the OCD behavior because their parent, it's making them feel safe. Yeah. And so we work on that with cognitive behavioral therapy and other things. So, right, yeah. right. so that's yeah, kind of the, the four sort of pronged approach. So their direct answer to question is, no, IVIG can work for any particular cause of pans or pandas, not just the strep. Okay, great, right, great. I'm glad you worked your way back to that. <laughs> yeah, so and, yeah, that's great to know, um, but it must be even harder to even get um, confirmation from the insurance company, you know, if, if it is another pathogen. I don't know how strict the criteria are uh, in Indiana uh, right. to be able to get payment for the IVIG unless- So the benefit, well, the law, the way we had the law written here was pandas or pans, fortunately. Right. But I think what I would say is this, I would say um, in one of the mistakes I've seen made, I don't want to call it a mistake, but I don't want to be critical, but one of the mistakes I've seen made um, I've had some children come to me whose parent, and it's, I'll tell you, 90% of the children that come to me, their parent made the diagnosis when everyone else missed it or told them it wasn't or it was nonsense. They made the diagnosis and they come to me and say, my child is pandas. And I'm like, you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. They do. But, um, you know, in one of the things I'll see is parents will come to me and say, well, we took them to the pediatrician and they tested their strep antibodies and, and swabbed their throat and said, none of those are positive. So it's not pandas. Pandas is a clinical diagnosis. It's a diagnosis based on a list of criteria. You don't need any blood test. And what we know about throat swabs, what we know about blood antibodies like ASO and anti-DNAs is they go up and then they go down after a while. And sometimes the symptoms don't start till a month or two later. Mm. So if I have a child who comes to me who fits all of the criteria, I don't know if a problem, the only current diagnostic code is B95.5, which is pandas. It's the only one that fits. So I don't have a problem in my mind. I use the term pans. But I don't have a problem calling all the children pan does because I would say prove to me that it wasn't strep. Like, I don't know that it wasn't strep. You don't know that it wasn't strep. So that's what I typically code them as is pandas or I'll code them as autoimmune encephalitis, which is what it is. Um, and then there are some other diagnosis involving their immune system, immune system impairment and things, which we sometimes use to help get the therapies, therapies covered. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So great. I, I love the way you explained all of the symptoms and all the possible causes. Where do you go? Where, where do you start with treatment? And I'm, you know, I'm sure 
it's, you know, varies from patient to patient based mm-hmm. on how they present and, and what they're willing to do at the moment, because it can be overwhelming. Right. I, you know, I see yes. a similar population, but, you know, basically what are the areas uh, do you make sure that you hit in terms of treatment? Mm. So the first step in, in my mind, and it's a theme I've been working on a lot lately that I've been, I've been writing about and, and is the idea of curiosity. And I've come to believe that I used to think that the, if there was only one thing we owed our patients, it was compassion. I don't think that's the case. Yes, we owe them compassion, but I think what we owe them more is curiosity. So mm-hmm. we don't owe them frustration or whatever. We owe them curiosity because all the great problems in history were solved because people became curious and said, I wonder if I just X and then whatever that X was, they fill that in and we built airplanes. We Mm -hmm. built a car. We discovered penicillin, like all these things. Right. So I start by trying to be curious and never making an assumption. Um, You know, if children come to me and someone's told them I have pandas, they have to prove it to me before I really, I have to make sure that it's not a brain tumor or something else. Like I don't trust anybody but myself. And I think that's how you stay curious. So what I'll first do, it's five basic steps. So one, number one is, is identify, and we call this the fully functional approach. It's how we just explain it to patients, but identify what's going on. And that's first of all, going through the story, listening. It's my typical first appointment. Our first appointment's about an hour, an hour and a half. So we're listening to their story. A lot of folks have not been able to tell anyone their story. No one listens. It's if you have a 10 minute appointment with your physician, you're going to get 10 minutes. And I feel for physicians who work in settings where they're the whip is cracked on their back that you only have 10 minutes to see a patient. They're doing the best they can, but people can't tell a good story in 10 minutes. And, you know, I know I was an overworked physician years and years and years ago, and it's hard to be compassionate and listen. (laughs) You just kind of want to keep the machine moving. And so, so we take time and listen, we identify what's going on with, from their story, then we identify what's going on based on doing a, a nutrition oriented history and physical exam. So I will have people come into the office. I will examine them head to toe. And we're looking for specific things in kids with um, pans and pandas. So we're looking at vital signs, signs of dehydration if they're not eating or drinking, mm-hmm. malnutrition, wasting those things. We also are looking for heart murmurs. Some of the children who have had strep can develop rheumatic heart disease. So we always listen for heart murmur. If anything's weird, we get an echocardiogram based on that and lungs and belly and all sorts of other things. And we're looking for weird skin rashes and reflexes in a neurologic exam, making sure we're not missing something very odd. Um, So do that, then we do testing. So we typically do blood testing, urine testing, um, and we're looking for the typical labs you mentioned, right? We're doing a CBC, Mm -hmm. we're doing a metabolic profile to look for diabetes, liver disease, all those things. And then, we tend to do some immune system labs through the blood. We also do some blood labs to look for specific infections that we know can be involved. So Lyme disease, Bartonella, which is another tick-borne illness, right. Epstein-Barr virus, which um, recently has, has become sort of more of a cause of pans that we've noticed. Um, fortunately, we've not seen too many kids flare from COVID. Mm. I, I thought it would be terrible, but we haven't seen too many. And I have a very particularly weird phenomenon, which is I have two children that I've been seeing for about a year that both got COVID and all their symptoms went away and never came back. Whoa. I, I explain <laughs> what great, and I, I, I'm not telling any of the other parents, I don't want them to take their children to COVID party. <laughs> right. But for whatever reason, and uh, many others got it and didn't change at all. So I don't know that right. it's causally effective, but I was just kind of like, that's weird. That's but, so fascinating. So we also do um, typically um, urine testing to look for mycotoxins to see if there's been a mold exposure. We sometimes have parents test their homes to look for that. But mold, the link there seems to be that mold exposures, you know, mycotoxins from mold exposures do several things. They depress the immune system. Um, mm-hmm. They are also a direct neurotoxin. They disrupt the gut barrier. So they are a cause of leaky gut. And then lastly, they mess up hormones. So they mm-hmm. mess with sleep and weight right. gain and all sorts of other things. So from that standpoint, I feel like based on all the research and the patients we've seen, I think what starts this process for a lot of kids is they're exposed to mycotoxins either at home or at school where there's been a water, water damage or high humidity. That then d- dysregulates the immune system. Then this seemingly benign pathogen strep jumps on board. 
-hmm. and it goes haywire, their body goes haywire. So we know that mold exposures are a trigger for lots of other types of autoimmunity. Absolutely. And I think that that's the crux of what we see with a lot of these kids. Of the kids we've tested, and we're currently analyzing that data, we're working on the paper, but of the kids that we've tested, 100% have had elevated levels of mycotoxins. And when we've brought those levels down over time and gotten their house situation straightened out, that's part of their recovery. So those are some, some tests that we do. We also test for immunoglobulins and we do an anti-nuclear antibody to look for autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so identify is the first step. We're getting all the information. Then the next step is reducing things that are negatively impacting their health. So removing inflammatory foods if we can. Um, a lot of times we will treat inflammation, reduce inflammation with anti-inflammatories. Um, we will... Um, you know, contaminants, environmental contaminants, stuff in the home, any disease that we find on testing, the reduced part is where we're, we're treating that. The next step is um, optimizing detoxification. So we work on, you know, uh, optimizing detoxification through the liver. If children are old enough, we'll do infrared sauna with them, red light therapy, all those things, exercise, time out in the sun, all that stuff. But optimizing detoxification, these kids, people that have mycotoxin illness, whether it's children or adults, tend to be uh, people that don't detoxify very well. So we work on that. The next step is support. And so we try and support um, the brain, neurological membranes. We use a lot of phosphatidylcholine orally to help brain health and help mm -hmm. detoxify and, and stabilize cell membranes. We use palmitoyl ethanolamide to help with that. Mm -hmm. um, and also the other part of support is we have uh, every family is assigned sort of a health coach to that checks in on them consistently. This is a family disorder. It's very traumatic for the parents. Most of the time they'll tell you they feel like their child's been snatched away and abducted um, right. and just, you know, gone. And so mm -hmm. that's really a, a vital part of it is support. We have an online program that we're currently updating it, but um, I invite all, all of our parents in it. It's through Thinkific and we send them a link and invite them in. It's got a lot of videos, what to tell your school um, right. how to make sure your child's getting their IEP or 504 so they're not punished for being sick. Um, what to tell your family and friends because it's a lonely disease. You know, we, we've always said it's God forbid, but when your child has cancer, people know what to do with that, right? They like right. make you a Facebook group and go fund me and they bring you meals. When this happens and your child's acting crazy, mm -hmm. people don't quite know how to deal with it. And that happened with us, like the friends kind of scattered. A lot of times people will say unhelpful things, you know, you're, right. you're a permissive parent, you just need to discipline them, right. you know, whatever. And, you know, it, it just, it's hard. So support is a big piece of it. And then lastly is personalization, our last step. So that personalization piece is when we're getting everything back. So when we very first see the child in the office, we figure out if we can change the diet at all. Um, and then we will typically start them on... Um, some supplements will we'll use a lot of um, SPM omegas, so omegas with specialized pro-resolving mediators to right. help stop inflammation. We use curcumin when we can. And um, I also use a fair amount of palmitoyl ethanolamide, PEA. Mm -hmm. um, it particularly is good for helping stop intrusive thoughts. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah, magnesium is extremely helpful. Um, we have a, a something we give children at, at night. It's a, a drink kind of mixture, but it's got magnesium, uh, theanine in it. It's mm -hmm. got GABA, a little bit of GABA in it and some inositol. Right. Uh, inositol is very good for, for anxiety producing behavior. And it's not uncommon if I see a very sick child initially, I will start them usually on antibiotics before I get any of the blood work back. So it's a conversation with the parents, obviously. But if you look at the guidelines from the National Institute of Mental Health, they will say when there's an initial flare or a flare later, typically the initial step would be either starting a steroid or starting antibiotics. Um, we typically would start antibiotics at mm -hmm. that point. I don't always, but but a lot of times we do. And is that when a we short get the course? Is that a, back, is that a we have to change. Is that a short course of antibiotics or do you keep them on long term? Yeah, so um, <laughs> it, it's a conversation with the parents, obviously. Right. And so from a functional medicine standpoint, obviously we don't like people on, on antibiotics because it's disruptive of the gut microbiome, but 
In this case, the treatment of pans and pandas uh, that we found that works well in the literature tends to very much mimic rheumatic fever. And in cases of rheumatic fever, the current recommendation is keeping people on antibiotics till 21. We don't do that. Hmm. But um, typically, we'll initially start. So I'll get labs and things and then see the child back in about six weeks. I usually, if I'm going to start them on antibiotics, we'll start them and then um, keep them at least till I see them again and then determine do I have to switch antibiotics or stop or how's the child doing. And fortunately, we're very good at, you know, we'll give we give children saccharomyces and other probiotics and give their parents a lot of instructions, both what to look for in terms of adverse side effects of antibiotics. And fortunately, they seem to be resilient and they seem to bounce back. We haven't had anyone, adult or child, that's ended up with um, Clostridium difficile diarrhea or any of those things from antibiotics. So it's not something we want to do, but I always tell parents, think of it kind of like rheumatic fever. Um, and so there are rare cases where we'll end up with a child that's on for a longer period of time, six months, a mm. year. That's pretty rare. Um, a lot of times if that's going on, I really get curious and step back a place and think, I'm missing something here. There's the, the immune system still dysregulated. There's a toxin. There's still mold in the house. Something's going on. Maybe there's mold in the school, something. Um, I just always, every time I see people at an appointment, I always kind of rewind and figure out where do we leave off last time? What's happened since then? And then how do I figure out where to go yeah. from here? Yeah, yeah. You and I have a very similar approach in the way being curious. I love the way that you started with being curious and also getting the, the patient to be curious and increase mm -hmm. their awareness and really notice right. what's going on and connecting the dots and and I, I say, you have to put your Sherlock Holmes hat on oh, yeah. with me, you know? Yeah. So there's so many things that I want to say about what you just said. <laughs> so I was just like, where do I start? But yeah, yeah. you know, it's interesting how you, you've gone, you really go through all the layers and it is peeling back the onion essentially and really keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. What's the next stone we have to under unturn? And, and what you're looking for is a drop in, in signs of inflammation, essentially, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's exactly what I do in, in the same, same way is keep looking for those, those possible causes of inflammation. Right. So you, you didn't mention a stool test, which I found mm -hmm. interesting is, do you do a stool test as well? I do. I absolutely do. I do stool testing. I it, it it's not in the forefront of my mind. It is with all my other kids that I see because I see kids for other other reasons too. Yeah. Sometimes I don't do it initially because you know for any stool testing you have to be off antibiotics or probiotics right. for a period of time beforehand. So a lot of times that's a test that I'll forego. So the two tests that I kind of sometimes put on the table and wait a while on are food allergy and sensitivity testing. So if I have a child that's food restricting. I'll kind of say like I and especially because um, you can have children if they're older, if you have a kid that's 13, 14, 15 year olds and they have severe OCD, if they somehow get wind of the food sensitivity testing, which, as you know, you can sometimes end up with lots of food sensitivities. They'll look at that and think if I eat any of these things, I'll die and then they'll it'll make the restriction worse. So sometimes I wait on that and then sometimes I wait on the stool test if I'm going to start the child on antibiotics. A lot of times they come to me and they're pretty in pretty rough shape they're pretty critically ill um and so we'll uh we'll a lot of times hold that and i'll do the stool test later and you know because i know i'm probably then later going to be looking at at yeast and and those things um, right. i haven't seen there have been some cases where the story's been a little weird and i've done stool testing immediately or not done antibiotics right away i haven't really run into any children with parasites that i felt like the parasites are causing this behavior. I haven't, I just haven't found that yet. And, mm -hmm. um, but I don't do as many stool tests, obviously in these kids as I do in most. Right, right, right. Yeah. That's it. It's because that's usually the test that I do pretty much on everyone, but I see a different oh, yeah. population. I do see some, some adolescents and kids, but for the most part, it's, it's uh, adults. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I've had my fair share was certainly not as many as yours, Oh, your patients, uh, but I have had my fair share of seeing patients with pans and pandas and uh, arriving at that diagnosis, mostly because of exposure to you and 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 Thank the you. work that you do, and uh, as well as the neuroimmune conference that just happened. Uh, so if anyone's interested annually, uh, they do put out a conference uh, that discusses specifically 
conditions like pans and pandas just to educate l literally the world <laughs> about mm -hmm. this syndrome. So, uh, so keep your uh, eyes and ears out. I actually always put it on my uh, Instagram and Facebook mm -hmm. posts to let the, let people know about it. And it's usually in the month of May. Right. So look for it next year, guys. And uh, so how can people find you? I know you're seeing people from all over the country. How about the world? I'm sure too, right? Um, yeah. Um, so people can find us. Our, our uh, business website is um, called fullyfunctional.com. Uh, and we are the Center for Fully Functional Health is, is our business name. That's where we see patients in person in our brick and, brick and mortar. Um, and we are online. Um, on and that's Facebook. in Indiana. We, just in so Indiana, it's Carmel, funny. Indiana. Mm -hmm. And we are on Facebook. We just changed the name. It's fully functional on Facebook. And then on uh, Instagram, we are the Pandas Docs. So oh. that's where you will find us on Instagram. That's great. And you have, you said you have a book coming out soon. Working on it. I'm heading upstairs to work on it here shortly. <laughs> yeah, we're working on it. I think it's going to. Um, it's really going to probably end up be initially geared toward physicians. And the reason is because a lot of the medical community now is starting to warm up a bit to pandas, at least not quite pans yet, but pandas at least. But basically patients are treated. If, if doctors are kind of playing along, they will treat them basically with antibiotics, steroids, IVIG, and then psychiatric medications. And each of those things kind of have their place at times, but that's all right and so then they end up and so i'm a, a firm believer that i think we need a better way which is probably very much like what you're doing with psychiatry that we need to look at a lot of other things right um because i i think there's a lot of it so for example there are some physicians that treat pans and pandas that 100 percent of the children they give ivig to like it, every single one it's mm -hmm. only about 10 percent of our kids that end up needing ivig right and so i think right. if you can avoid Giving a child a blood product is probably a good right. idea. I don't mind giving it to them and it can be really helpful, but if we can do other stuff, then we don't need to do that. And we can regulate the immune system with low dose naltrexone or some other thing like that. It can be, be really helpful. Right. And I think what people need to understand is that, you know, the difference is the conventional world looks at downstream, they treat mm -hmm. downstream effects of a condition. Right. And what the functional world, me medicine world does is look upstream and essentially turn off the tap that's causing the inflammation and let out the drain. If this was a tub, oh, yeah. you know, filling up with water and overflowing, what we would be doing is turning off the tap and letting out right. the drain. And so then there's nothing happening downstream. It just stops. Right. And so I think both approaches are very important. They have their place because mm -hmm. if you're in acute distress and can't function, That's absolutely right. you need psychiatric medication. Absolutely yep. you need antibiotics. So it's always looking at the benefits versus the risks and giving good mm -hmm. in informed consent when it comes to this is what I'm recommending and why. And, but while we're doing that, we're also going to do this, look upstream and figure out what's going on that is causing the symptoms. And while we're dealing with that, we're going to continue the SSRI medications for the mental health yeah. issues and the antibiotics for the inflammation mm -hmm. or the pathogen that's creating yeah. the inflammation. And then, and then hopefully once we bring those uh, upstream effects uh, or put them away or take care of them, then you mm -hmm. can stop the antibiotics and right. stop the SSRIs. And so, yeah, you, you know, we, that's so important to have, and that's great that you have your feet in both worlds. That's exactly what I tell people in both. Like when worlds. people come to me on, on SSRIs or, or on antipsychotics, a lot of these children end up on those medications. I tell the parents, fine, let's just continue them for a while. I think one of the dangerous things you can do if you have a child that's been on those medications and you would know more than me, but there are people in the kind of integrative world that that say well all medicine's bad just stop everything that's mm -hmm. when you have a child that's been on medicines that you know alter neurologic um membranes for a period of time if you just stop it suddenly that's dangerous and so right. um people can withdraw and so i always tell parents maybe we'll we'll pull that off later worry about that later no pressure let's just do some right. other stuff now and then see if we can wean that down later along in concert with your psychiatrist. And I have a few, I have just brand new, one of the brand new psychiatrists just here in my town is very open to pandas and it's very helpful because I can call her 
That's and great. say, what's your recommendation for medication at this point? Or if we want to taper this other medicine off, what's your recommendation? And that's awesome. so helpful to me. That is awesome. That's so awesome that you have someone who's open-minded to the approach mm -hmm. and being curious with you. Right. They're being right. curious with you. That's so important because, you know, we, I think we as physicians and all medical professionals really need to understand that we can't know everything, you mm -hmm. know, and that there's probably so much more to learn, you know, and, you know, at, at least that's the approach that I have and that it's yeah. important to have partners in care and being able to work with others uh, so that that can happen. But I agree with you. I actually tell people we're not going to change any medications unless you're having some serious side effects mm -hmm. or you know if you're having serious side effects then the risks outweigh the benefits but if sure. you're not having side effects it's keeping your your symptoms in check for now it may not be perfect but right. you're functioning and you're not in severe distress let's right. just keep the medications the same and then mm -hmm. it, the other thing that i always tell people is that when you get better while mm -hmm. you're on the same medications you're actually going to know in your heart that it's not the medicines that are making right. you better. So then you'll have more confidence to be able to start tapering and discontinuing it. And it should be always tapered and discontinued, yeah. not just stop. So if there's any professionals out there that are not medical doctors or, or, or nurses or, you know, providers, medical providers, then uh, they shouldn't be making any recommendations about medications at all. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's, you know, there's there's little that we know. And, I, and I've had patients come to me before and say, I've been, you know, I wanted to kill myself every day till I got on this medication 10 years ago. Stay on the medicine. <laughs> exactly. Right. Depending well, the benefit you know, the risks. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. Especially so. if the root causes haven't been addressed because Correct. the medicines are just right. suppressing the symptoms. So if you right. stop them, those symptoms will absolutely come back if you've done nothing different. That's you know, right. Yeah. You know, we see that with with PPIs all the time with medicines like Nexium and things where, you know, ultimately they aren't good for you to be on long term. But if you, those are a medicine, if you stop suddenly and a lot of well-meaning kind of folks seeing these people for nutritional therapy will say, stop that medicine is terrible for you. Well, that's true. But if you stop a PPI, suddenly you'll get a call two days later with a furious patient that's got their gut on fire. And so that is, you're right. You have to fix the other stuff before you would ever think of weaning that off over to months. Probably. Absolutely. Yes. And you're 100%. That's a great example. Yeah. So Dr. Antoine, this was great. This is a great hour with you and learning about pans and pandas. And I'm hoping that this will inform many people and improve their knowledge about this condition and hopefully get any of our kids. It's mostly kids and young adults. Um, you know, we didn't talk about how, why, or how, uh, you know, this doesn't occur in adults. Um, but, you know, apparently they're not in this group and that's maybe another episode sometime in the future. But uh, I'm hoping that this will help people to get help sooner and not suffer for those two years. I actually thought it was longer. I'm glad it's just two years, but I thought it was like five years, six years before people get- it, it, uh, Sometimes it is. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, but you know, if it's an average of two years, it, that's great. So let's make it months, a couple months instead of years mm -hmm. to get treatment ASAP. Right. Right. So thank you so much. God bless you. And thank uh, you. Thank you. So, you know, at Functional Mind, we treat pans and pandas as well. And it is definitely a very similar approach. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Antoine drills down in terms of the antibiotics. And we, uh, we have other providers that help us with the antibiotic piece uh, and uh, certainly the IV IG piece. But, uh, but in terms of the root causes, we address all the root causes, just like Dr. Antoine does at Functional Mind. All right. Take care. Thank you.